All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Donnie Berry. I am one of the pastors here at Christian Fellowship. It's good to be with you this morning. You may have noticed in the seat pocket in front of you this uh, this brochure right here. If you haven't, um, I hope you will take note of that. We're going to be talking about this this morning. We are launching a new plan for growth and discipleship at Christian Fellowship. My original name for this was the Christian Fellowship Discipleship Track. And those with more creative capabilities and and just more sensibility in general, thought that that title wasn't exactly catchy. And so we're also calling it Grow. So, as Mike said last week, he said growth is the process of being formed in the image of Christ for the sake of others. That's what growth, spiritual formation is. The process of being formed in the image of Christ for the sake of others. And we want to help that happen at Christian Fellowship in your life, in all of our lives together. And so that's what this, that's what GROW is about. So so my plan today is simply to give some of the rationale for GROW from the scriptures, answer some questions about what is growth and why do we grow and how do we grow. And then I want to equate you with this new thing that we're launching together this morning, all with the the purpose of encouraging us all to engage in this together. So if you would, let's pray together this morning. Father, thank you for our time together this morning. We thank you for your grace and your mercy that we've already sung about this morning. We thank you for your word that we get to open together. We pray that through it you would, you would speak to our hearts. We want to pursue growth. We want to know you and for our lives to be formed into the image of Christ for the sake of others. And so would you, by your spirit, um, help that to happen this morning. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. In every human heart, I believe there's a desire to grow. We want life. We want to be fully alive. Not to be stuck in our selfishness and our self-absorption and our brokenness and our empty living. We want to live, really live. I think that's why why stories, so many of our stories, our movies, um, have have this theme of a transformation of a character. You know the stories I'm talking about where you've got somebody who's self centered or materialistic or caught up in all the wrong things and oblivious to others and self absorbed, but through the course of the story they they come awake to what life is really about and they're transformed and their life is suddenly new to them. You know, you think of of um, Ebenezer Scrooge. And the transformation he undergoes. Or, or the modern equivalent, one of my favorites, Groundhog Day. Um, where Bill Murray plays Phil Connor, who goes from this self-absorbed news weatherman to, to finding out what life is really about. And those stories capture us. They, they tap something deep within us. Because I think we all carry that longing in us. That longing for more. That longing to be alive, fully awake to what life is about. We may not know where to find it, how to get it, what it even looks like, but there's that longing for something more in us. And Jesus tells us that he's the answer to that longing. He's the one who gives us life to the full. He says, I came that you may have life and life in abundance. And he's the one who transforms us so that his life little by little, takes over every part of us. And we come alive and we grow into the fullness of what living really is. So, so the big question this morning is, how does that happen? How do we grow? And here's the key idea this morning. We grow into the fullness of Christ through the gospel applied by the Holy Spirit in community. Let me say that again. We grow into the fullness of Christ through the gospel 
applied by the Holy Spirit in community. That's how we grow, how we come alive, and how we're formed into the image of Christ for the sake of others. So if you have your Bibles or your smartphones, turn to Ephesians chapter 3 with me. I want us to see how Paul lays out each of these elements, the gospel applied by the Holy Spirit in community in his letter to the Ephesians, and how these work together to bring about what it means to be fully alive to God and to live as God intended us to. So Ephesians chapter 3, my temptation as I was preparing this, when, when you get into Ephesians, it's so hard to find a starting point to jump in in the middle of it because the whole book hangs together as one unfolding argument. And so, so I'm like, I, really what I need to do is just read the whole letter of Ephesians to you this morning. Um, I'm not going to do that, but I would encourage you sometime, it would be a great exercise to go and read this letter. Um, but we're going to jump in in Ephesians chapter 3, and we're going to start in verse 7. So Ephesians 3, 7, the Apostle Paul says this, Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. Okay, stop right there. Paul says God gave him a grace to be a minister of the gospel. What is the gospel that Paul is a minister of? Well, the the word gospel itself, you may know this, that the word itself in the Greek, which is what the New Testament was originally written in, the word is euangelion. That, That word means good news. It's where we get our word evangelist from or evangelism, one who shares the gospel or shares the good news. So Paul says he was given a gift of God's grace to minister the good news. The gospel. And what is that good news or gospel? Well, in verse 8, he says, To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. So Paul says, I was given a gift of God's grace, to be a minister of the gospel. And then he says, I was given grace to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. Do you see the connection? What is the gospel Paul proclaims? Paul proclaims the unsearchable riches of Christ. The gospel is a person. And he proclaims the plan that centers on that person, this eternal plan unfolding that God has brought to light and is bringing light through through Paul's ministry. So, the first key point you got to get is that the gospel is not primarily a what, it's a who. The gospel is not first and foremost a set of doctrines or teachings. Like, what is the gospel? Well, lay out, well, it's this truth and this truth and this truth. No, the gospel, first and foremost, is Jesus Christ and his unsearchable riches. That's what Paul preaches. So let me give it to you in a math equation. Can you guys do some math with me this morning? All right, here's the math equation. The gospel equals... Jesus. See, that's pretty simple, right? You guys didn't think you could do math. Look, you can do that. The gospel equals Jesus. How simple is that? The unsearchable riches of Jesus and God's eternal purpose. His grand unfolding story and history written in the pages of Scripture that centers on Jesus. That's the gospel. So, I see it written across your faces right now. You're saying, okay, you seem really excited about this, but what's the big deal? So what? Well, well, my goal this morning is to help you get excited about this too. So, So why is this such a big deal? What is the big deal about this? Well, for me growing up, I grew up in a Baptist church, and I'm so thankful for my heritage, the good church that I grew up in where the word of God was preached week after week. It shaped me in really wonderful ways. There's something in the tradition of the Baptist church where um, whatever the sermon is week by week, there's always this turn about two minutes from the end where the pastor will say, 
Now, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord, and then he'll go into a gospel presentation where he'll say, Jesus died for you and rose again and he loves you. And if you'll, in just a moment, we're going to invite people to walk forward and you can pray a prayer with me and you can become a Christian. And what happened in me was, that's what I understood to be the gospel. Okay, what you, if you would have asked me, what is the gospel? I would have said, well, it's the last two minutes of the sermon, the part where we talk to non-Christians about how Jesus died for them and they can become a Christian if they believe in Jesus. And that's kind of as far as it goes from there. That was my understanding of the gospel. That's not wrong. That is the gospel in part. What my pastor got right is that the gospel does center on Jesus and his death and his resurrection in place of sinners. But what he didn't quite seem to communicate, or maybe to be fair to him, what, what I didn't quite grasp or pick up on was that the gospel is far richer than just the beginning of how you become a Christian. Tim Keller says it this way. Tim Keller, who's a well-known pastor and author, he says the gospel is not just the ABC but the A to Z of the Christian life. The gospel is not just the way to enter the kingdom, but is the way to address every problem and is the way we grow at every step. The gospel is the whole of our Christian life. And Paul tells us that as believers who have put our trust in Christ, we have been joined to him by faith. So that, like what happens in marriage, the Bible says two become one flesh, that's all a picture and a pointer to what happens when we put our trust in Christ. We become one with him. And when that happens, it's as we say in our marriage vows, all that I am and will become, all that I have and will have, it's yours now. This is what becomes true for us as believers when we put our trust in Christ. All his unsearchable riches become ours because we're joined to him by faith. So Jesus says to us, all that I have and will have, all that I am and will become is yours. I am yours and all my unsearchable riches. And so you can stop looking to lesser things to fill you. This is the gospel. Paul's already told us in the beginning of Ephesians, and this is why it it becomes, it's very tempting to just want to go back and say, well, we've got to go through the whole of the letter for you to get this. But Paul says in Ephesians chapter one, he lays out these unsearchable riches of Christ for us. When he says things like this, you were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. God set his love on you. He has adopted you in Christ as his children. You've been given an inheritance in Christ, an eternal inheritance. You've been given the gift of the Holy Spirit who's a pledge that you will receive this inheritance. You've been raised with Christ and seated with him in heavenly places. The very power that raised Jesus from the dead now lives in in you, and you have an eternal hope that cannot be shaken. These are the unsearchable riches Paul talks about that he now says, all of them are yours in Christ. And this is the gospel he proclaims. And then he brings to light this eternal plan, this great mystery now made known of what God is doing. He says it in chapter three, verse 11. He says, this was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized In Christ Jesus, our Lord. So Paul's preaching this grand story that encompasses all of history, all of creation, all of our lives, centering on Jesus Christ. It's the story that goes something like this. The God who made everything, who created flowers and stars and DNA and humor and love and everything that whispers his name and echoes of his beauty is the same God that we rebelled against and whose goodness and beauty and love we rejected. But he's the same God who loved us just the same 
those of us who have dishonored him and broken his creation and distorted it and abused it and abused one another and who's come to rescue us and to rescue his world in the most incredible way by entering into it himself and taking on flesh and bearing all the brokenness that we inflicted on his world and all the brokenness in our lives. He bears it on the cross so that he can begin restoring and making it new. And he's the same God who offers forgiveness of sins to wash us and cleanse us, to restore and to heal us. And not just us, but his entire creation and who will one day make all things infinitely more wondrous than we can even begin to imagine now. And he offers all of this to us. This is the story Paul proclaims. This is the gospel. And it's so much better than the other stories that we tend to live. Stories like, you are what you do. So you better work really hard to make something of yourself and make a name for yourself so you can feel significant and quiet all the insecurities that you carry with you. Or the, you are what you buy story. So try to get enough money to buy all you want so it can make you feel better for a little while at least. Or the, you are what other people think of you story. So run hard on the treadmill of trying to measure up and look the part and be enough and say the right thing and win people's approval and affection and and oh yeah, don't forget to play the comparison game so you know how you're stacking up in this story. And God just invites us into an entirely different, entirely better story. His story centered on the riches of Christ for us individually and for all of creation. All things united and set right and made beautiful through Christ once again. This is the story we're meant to find ourselves in and the story that's meant to shape us. So, if you're like me, that sounds really great. We grow through the gospel, through Jesus' unsearchable riches and through learning to live in his story. Great. But you still got the look on your face. The, um, okay, what does that really look like though? Look, right? Okay, so, so I'm not done yet. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep working with you here till you get this. So what does this really look like in our lives? How does this really happen? Well, this is where we come to the second piece of of our definition of what it looks like to grow, the gospel applied by the Holy Spirit in community. So let's look at applied by the Holy Spirit, this piece. So Paul's just said God gifted him with the task of preaching the unsearchable riches of Christ and bringing to light this eternal plan that God is unfolding that centers on Jesus. And to get this, gospel to get this message is the thing we need more than anything so what does Paul do this is what he does Ephesians 3 verse 14 for this reason because this is so important because I want you to get this so much for this reason I bow my knees before the father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Paul prays. Because Paul knows, just like you and I know and have experienced, that you can hear all these incredible things. You can hear the gospel. You can hear about Jesus. You can hear about his unsearchable riches, about this great story that we're meant to live in and be a part of. You can hear it, but not really hear it. You know what I mean? You can can get it, but not, really get it. And Paul knows that. And so he prays. We've got categories for this, right? This is why we talk about things like, like head knowledge and heart knowledge. Like, like I've got head, I, I've got it in my head. I know the truth. I know the gospel. I know God loves me. I know it here. I just don't know it here. How do I get it here, right? We talk like that sometimes. How do I get it here so that it shapes me, so that it affects me, so that it transforms me? Well, Paul's starting point is, he says, I pray. 
I bow my knee before the Father. That's how the chasm gets crossed. And what does Paul pray? Here's what he prays. Verse 16, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Do you hear it? What's Paul praying for? That God would strengthen you with power through his Holy Spirit in your inner being. The Holy Spirit would take the gospel and press it into you in a way that you get it. And when that happens, Paul says, verse 17, so that, so the Holy Spirit pressing this into us, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. The gospel applied by the Holy Spirit, the unsearchable riches of Christ, the Holy Spirit strengthening us so that we can get that within so that Christ can dwell in our hearts by faith. Now Paul's writing to believers here who Christ already lives in them. So he's not praying that they would become believers and then Christ would live in their hearts. He's he's talking about a different kind of dwelling here. Kind of dwelling where Christ takes up residence in us. That these unsearchable riches of Christ would really take root in our lives. It's it's the kind of dwelling, it's it's not like the renter. Anybody ever ever had a renter in your home um, where you, you, maybe you've had a basement. You've got a, you know, a basement bedroom, maybe even a little kitchen, a little basement apartment. You're like, no, I, we should rent that out and get some extra income. And so somebody's now renting your basement. They come in, they live in the basement, they use the basement entrance and exit. You never really see them. You just get the rent check every month and it's a great arrangement. Things work out. That's not the kind of dwelling Paul's praying for here. Paul's praying for a dwelling where, where somebody moves into the upstairs of your house where you live. And they begin to just put their stuff everywhere. Like they own the place. Like, like they're just filling up all the rooms with their stuff. Even your bedroom. It's like, this is my room. This is my space. But they're just taking up the space. And, and they begin to kind of make it their own. And say, you know what? I, I, I think we could decorate a little differently here. I think the wall colors could, we could really brighten these things some. And, um, and you're just watching thinking, but this is my house. And, you know, I think we uh, really, we should knock this wall out. We could do something entirely, let's knock this wall out. Let's, and they just begin to, their presence invades everything. And they take over everything. And at first you're like, but this is my space. But as they do it, you begin to realize, this is actually, this is actually good. I like having them around. Like, this is, this is actually an improvement. Things are looking better around here. Like, like my drab world is actually becoming colorful. Like, that, that's the kind of presence, the kind of dwelling that Paul's praying for here. That Christ would dwell in you by faith. The Holy Spirit would cause him to begin to take up and fill all the space of your life. Jesus' way of saying it in John 16, 14, he says, when the Spirit comes, he will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and make it known to you. This is what the Holy Spirit does. He glorifies Jesus by taking all that is Jesus's, all the truth about him, all the riches of Christ, and he makes it known to us. Not known here, but known here in a way that it fills our lives and takes up all the space. That's what Paul prays for. And he goes on to say that he prays that we would be rooted and grounded in God's love and would know how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. A love that he says, verse 19, a love that surpasses knowledge. It's a love you can't just get on your own. It takes the Holy Spirit making it known to you. And as he does that, he says that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. This is what Paul prays. This is what the Holy Spirit does in us. He brings the gospel to bear on our lives and makes it real to us. But I know you're asking the question, but how does that happen? And I'm so glad you asked because I'm going to tell you. There are many ways actually that the Holy Spirit does this. The Holy Spirit, Jesus told us, he's like the wind He blows where he wills and we don't control him. And yet he uses means that he's given us. 
And there's one very big means he uses. And this gets us to the last piece of our, of our key idea this morning. We grow through the gospel applied by the Holy Spirit in community. In community. And now we begin to see the importance of belonging that Mike talked about last week. After Paul prays for us to really get the gospel at the beginning of Ephesians chapter 4, he then talks about how we are one body. We who are believers have been brought into one body and God's given grace to us so that we can minister to one another. So that's the beginning part of Ephesians 4. But I just want you to look at Ephesians 4 verse 11 with me. I want to read from there. Because the Apostle Paul says this, He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow. Everybody say grow with me. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow. Say grow with me. So that it builds itself up in love. Okay, did you get that? You get all of that. Sometimes, don't you just want to say, Paul, could you speak English here? Like, what are you doing, man? Like, like there were a lot of words there, and they sounded really fancy, but I'm not sure what you're saying. Right? Um, okay, well, let me break down for you what he's saying. Here's, here's the short version of it. Paul's saying in verse 11, God gave some specific offices within the church. Uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. He's given these offices so that the church, the saints as a whole, this is verse 12, can be equipped for the work of ministry so that all of us together can be equipped to do the things God has called us to do so that the whole body can mature and come into all the fullness of Christ together. And what does this work of ministry that he's given all of us together to do look like? How does that happen? Paul says in verse 15, it happens as we speak the truth in love to one another. And as we do that, he says, each member of the body, as each one does its part in speaking the truth in love, we grow up into him who is the head into Christ. So the key idea in this is that we grow into the fullness of Christ together as each of us does our part and speaks the truth in love to one another. So the question is, well, what does it mean to speak the truth in love to one another? Great question. Here's what it doesn't mean. This is, this is what I always thought. thought speaking the truth in love, that, that means you're, you're telling it like it is. You're just going to tell somebody what you think. You're going to be blunt. You might not have a lot of tact about it. You say, brother, I'm just speaking the truth in love. And that brother's saying, I don't think you are. That doesn't feel very loving. But that, that's what I always thought, speaking the truth in love. You're just, I'm just going to tell you what I think, tell you like it is. That's not what Paul has in mind here. Speaking the truth in love is about lovingly bringing the gospel to bear in one another's lives. Speaking the truth of the unsearchable riches of Jesus to one another, reminding one another of the story we're a part of and of who we are in Christ and of who he is and what that means for whatever I'm going through, whatever you're going through right now, that's speaking the truth in love to one another. And we do that for one another. And as we do that, we grow up into the fullness of Christ together. That's what Paul's saying. We learn the language of the gospel and we speak it to one another. Pastor and author Jeff Vanderstelt calls it gospel fluency, learning the language of the gospel, becoming fluent in the language of the gospel. If you've ever tried to learn a language, 
you know that there's a period of frustration. It's slow going at first as you labor over trying to learn vocabulary and the sentence structure and how the language goes together. And, and at first you have to, I mean, you're thinking about everything. Okay, this word, what's the equivalent? This word, what's the equivalent? Okay, to say this phrase, what's the equivalent? And you're kind of translating it in your head and going back and forth. You're not fluent. It's hard going. But as you persist in that, as you become fluent in that language, you no longer have to think about it as much. It, it becomes more natural for you. It's becoming the language you think in. You, you know you're beginning to cross over when you dream in that language. You think, okay, something's happening here. I had a dream, and, and in the dream, I was speaking the other language. You're becoming fluent. That's what it means to speak the truth and love to one another. That's what we want, to create a culture at Christian Fellowship where we are fluent in the gospel where it becomes the language, our heart language, where we see everything in light of Jesus. We speak to one another of the truth of Jesus. Every situation, we, are, we just go to the place of thinking, okay, what is the gospel? What does the truth about Jesus say here? What unsearchable riches of Jesus have bearing in this situation? And that's the way we see and think. That's becoming fluent in the gospel. That's what we're after. This is how we grow. We need one another to speak the gospel and to live out the gospel for one another, to remind each other of the riches of Christ that are ours and help us look away from ourselves to Jesus. I remember a, um, a few years ago, several years ago now, when we were um, in the middle of, of adopting one of our sons and, and we, were, we were hitting some snags in the whole process and I was really discouraged, um, really sad about not getting to be with our son and and at one point, I, I remember just telling God, it, it feels like you don't care about us. You've forsaken us. You've, I, I don't know what's going on, but, but you're not doing what I want you to do. And that really frustrates me. And, and so, I, so I just kept kind of, I mean, I spiraled down and down and down to the point where I was in such despair. I, um, I told God one day, I said, I'm done. I'm done with you. I'm done praying to you. I'm, I'm just done. And... Um, and I persisted in that for about three days. That's, a, that's an activity for you. Actually, I don't recommend it, but tr try not to pray. For, it was hard, but I did it. I said, I am not talking to him. <laughs> and I was in that place, and, and one of our friends came over, and he said, um, he said how are you doing? I said, yeah, you want to know how I'm doing? I'll tell you, and I, I laid, laid it all out for him. And he said, well, can I pray for you? And I said, sure, you pray. I'm not praying with you, but go for it. He said, okay. And so I kind of got in one of these poses. And, and he just started to pray. And as he prayed, he started just recounting truth about who God is. And he started praying Matthew chapter 10. He said, you're our father who loves us. Not even a sparrow falls to the ground apart from you. And we're of such value to you. Even the hairs on our head are numbered. You've not forgotten. You've not forsaken them in this. This is who you are. They're your children and you're, they're precious to you. And, and as he's just praying these things, what happened to me is my heart began to melt. And all the hardness, it's like the Holy Spirit broke right through it. And I repented and told God I was so sorry. And... I put my trust in him again, and I re-engaged. This is speaking the truth in love to one another. I couldn't do it for myself. I had tried to do it for myself. It didn't work, and I quit. And God gave me a brother to speak the truth into my life. And the Holy Spirit brought the gospel to bear on my life once again. This is how we grow together. We speak the truth in love. We grow through the gospel applied by the Holy Spirit in community. Okay, so if you have your flyer, I have, here it is. Yeah, grab this out of the seat pocket in front of you. I want to take just a couple minutes to walk through this with you. So we've been in conversations over the summer about how we can help us as a church, as individuals and together, how we can engage in growth, in knowing the gospel, growing through the gospel. And so, this is what we've come up with. Um, 
So, so there are four, if you see kind of the four, four big sections here. Let me just walk through each of these. We've got core classes. Some of these we've already talked about this morning during the announcements. Our Discovering CF class, which is kind of the DNA of who we are as a church and, and what we believe about God and salvation and, and church life together. This is great if you're newer to the church and, and are looking to understand who we are. Um, a new believers class we're offering starting in just a couple weeks. If you're exploring faith, you're new to the faith, you're not yet a Christian, but you're interested in what this Christianity stuff is all about, this would be great for you. And then these three classes that we're going to offer kind of in succession each semester, Christian Story, which is how to engage in the scripture and see the story of God and the gospel and read it for ourselves and engage with it. Christian Belief, which is theology, Christian Formation Life that we'll be offering um, in an ongoing basis. All of these classes are going to be going in an ongoing basis. We encourage everyone to take these classes because these are ways to learn the language of the gospel. That's their purpose, that you could learn the language of the gospel. And then there's the spiritual, the personal practices um, section. This is not an exhaustive list of personal practices or spiritual disciplines, but these are some of the, the rhythms or practices you can engage in to help you engage with scripture, with prayer, with other habits in your life that the Holy Spirit uses to create space to encounter Jesus for the gospel to come to bear on our lives. That's what these are about. We're encouraging everyone to, to consider one or two of these that you might focus on, that you might seek to grow in, um, in, in the coming months. And then we've got in the upper right section, relational growth. This is that community piece. We grow through the gospel applied by the Holy Spirit in community. And so we encourage everyone to be part of a men's or women's group or a prayer trio and we'll in the church office help connect you to other people to be part of one of those if you want or of living waters or small groups or, or many other ways that you can connect relationally. But here's the goal here, that everyone would have relationships where you're known, where when you're in one of those places like I was in, somebody shows up at your door and says, how you doing? And you can tell them and they can pray for you. Where community is so important, and so we want to help that happen. Where the the truth, we can speak the truth to one another in love. Now, when we say add one in all of these, we're not. So, if you're already part of a small group, or you're connected to the men's group or a women's group, or you have relationships like that, that's great. We're not saying now do more, but we're saying if if this isn't something that's part of your growth and your life right now, this is an important element that we want to encourage you to engage in. And then the, the final piece in the bottom right is serving, ministering, using the gifts God's given you. The body grows as each of us does our part and ministers grace that God's given us to one another. We're formed into the image of Christ for the sake of others. And so these are some of the ministries we have here at Christian Fellowship. And you'll see some of the ministries that, that we're a part of as a church into our city and some of the events we host. And there are lots of other ways besides just the things on this list. Again, these things aren't exhaustive. We've got more information on our website. We'll be adding to this as we go along. But these are, this is like a map. Think of this, you say, All right, I wanna grow. I want to really live, but I, where do I start? Well, this is like a map to say, well, consider, are you engaging in these areas? In, in getting the gospel in you, learning its language, and in being part of community uh, where you're hearing the gospel spoken and in serving and, and for the sake of others, living for the sake of others. This is how we want to encourage growth together. And so, so I'm sure this will maybe grow and evolve as it goes, but we see this as an ongoing thing um, just to give shape to how we grow together in Christ. So, here, one other thing I want to make note of before we finish this morning. Um, we're encouraging you to sign up for this. This isn't just to take this away and think, how can I do this? Okay, I'm going to do these things on my own and, and seek to grow in this way. We want to do this together. We're planning to... Um, to connect weekly, to send out encouragement, support, ideas, things like that. Um, you say, I want to grow in this personal practice. Well, we're hoping in the future to offer some workshops and things for, like Deb Schaefer is going to be offering for some of the ladies a, a workshop on silence and solitude and growing in that. And we want to do similar things with prayer, or engaging in scripture, things just to equip us in some of these things. Um, or help you connect. If you say, I, I don't really know, I'm not part of a small group, or how can I do that? And we'll send weekly um, encouragement just to engage us together in this. And so we're encouraging you to, you to sign up. You can do that 
through our website. We've got a table in the foyer where you can get more information and sign up. You can also text GROW to the church office, and that'll get you signed up for this um, so that we can do this together. Now, if you text the number that's on the back of your flyer, it won't get you to the church office because we have a typo here. And so everybody take note of that. We say 573-446. It's actually 445-8561. So, so please make note of that so we don't lose your text, okay? So, so we hope everyone will engage at this in, with, with us at some level so that we can grow together. Last thing... Last question to answer for you this morning, and this one's really quick. What's it look like to grow? What does it mean? How do we measure it, right? Because, it, because if you take this and you, you make this your check, everybody, anybody done the checklist Christianity thing where it's like, hey, I'm doing pretty good as long as I'm doing this and this and this, I feel pretty good. And, or if my behavior's improving and I'm getting, I feel pretty good about myself. Maybe God's okay with me. Maybe, this is not that. That's not what this is for. That's not how we measure Spiritual growth. How do we measure spiritual growth? Well, here's, here's the simple way. We measure it like this. Christ becomes bigger to you. That's what it looks like to grow. Christ becomes bigger to you. You become less focused on yourself and what you're doing and how you're doing and you're more focused on Christ. You're less focused on your weaknesses and your failures, and you're more focused on Christ and his mercy and his grace. You're, you're learning to look away from yourself to him. He's becoming bigger to you. This is what it looks like to grow. And this is what happens as we speak the truth in love to one another, as the Holy Spirit brings the gospel to bear in our lives. Christ becomes bigger to us, and we come alive inside. He permeates all the space of our life, and it's a good thing. That's how we grow together. So let's stand. We're going to close this morning just singing together, responding to the Lord um, as he's maybe stirred something in your heart. You can respond where you're at. I also want to give opportunity. If, if you're here and you'd like prayer this morning, You've carried some burden in with you, some, something that's just weighing on you. We would love to pray for you. And so I'd invite you as we sing to come forward and we'll have some people gather around you just to pray for you. Um, and then just in a few moments, we'll, we'll pray the prayer requests and I'll dismiss us.